Mark. Mark chapter 5. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor. I was already going. To, who went to 1 Thessalonians here? You looked at your notes. You were already that. You thought, ah, I'm going to go there to 2 Thessalonians. Well, Pastor called an audible on you tonight. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 is where we are going. Now, there's a couple things you should have picked up on the way in. First of all, you should have picked up a handout for the notes. Uh, I'm going to try something new. We've got them uh, on a chair. I noticed they were kind of crowding the offering plate, and that looks tacky anyway. So we thought, there's got to be a better way. And I thank God for my wife. My wife's like, get a chair. That would do it. I mean, thank you, Miss Tawny. And uh, so we put them on chair there. But you should have gotten not only a handout set of notes, but also a little half page, little half page worksheet. And if you didn't grab that, then grab that on your way out. It's called My Testimony Worksheet. And so, well, those are the two things. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 5 tonight, verse 19. Once you've found Mark chapter 5 tonight, then I want you to turn over with me to Galatians in chapter 6. Galatians in chapter 6, that's our scripture of the month. We'll be going over that tonight. I want to say thank you to, uh, to all of the folks of Rose Park Baptist Church. Who've, uh, I, I've seen you, and you're doing a wonderful job making Tim and Amanda feel welcome here. It's very different uh, when, when, uh, when there's one or two, there's two of you, and there's 150 of everybody else. Because we all know their names, and it's, str- it's a struggle to learn your names and faces. But I see you greeting them and welcoming them and making them feel very much at home. So thank you to each and every one, how you're making them feel warm and welcome that they're a part of and not only Rose Park Baptist Church, but our community and keep them in prayer right now they are in the thick of house hunting there's two things I hate number one is moving and number two house hunting those both those go together so would you please by all means keep this couple in prayer Um, they need God amen they need God to show them the right place at the right time they desperately need the Lord's blessings so I hope that you found Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 if you have let's read our scripture of the month together Galatians 6 9 and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not Galatians 6 9 wonderful story just a little thing T- turn your bibles back to mark chapter 5 i'll give you a second to go there uh, my wife and i spent the last oh, 10 years before we came here in uh, lima ohio it's a western ohio it's a very agrarian city all right or, or, or area the city itself is not uh, but as soon as you get right outside of the city of lima it turns into kansas very quickly all right and it's all corn and soybeans uh, for miles and miles and miles around and uh, one time my wife and I were over visiting with a church family and they had a little pond so we, we were fishing my once or twice a year I get to go fishing and uh, but I got to go fishing and it happened to be fall time and fall time in, in Lima it was go time I mean everybody's uh, everybody with a pickup truck was on the road and all the harvesters going everywhere dust is everywhere uh, corn dust uh, bean dust and all of that and I, I looked at Tony and I said you know I said I can tell we're not farmers I said, because everybody around here is working and we're playing. <laughs> now listen, there's a great spiritual truth to that. Christian, I don't want to be one of those Christians who are playing while every other Christian is working. I don't want to be every, where, where everyone else is busy around the Father's fields and I'm just sitting there fishing and having a good time. I want to be in the harvest. The Bible says we shall reap if we faint not. Now, take your Bibles and go back with me, if you have not already, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Thank you for making it out to a Wednesday service. I know it's difficult. I know Wednesday's right in the middle of the work week. I know there's uh, the schools coming up here, and August is a busy time, and folks are getting their last travels in and all that craziness in. And, uh, but I want to say thank you. This midweek service is important. This midweek service, this Wednesday service, is a wonderful time to get refreshed, re-encouraged, uh, rebuild up, fellowship a little bit, sing a little bit, praise the Lord a little bit. It's a wonderful time to get a spiritual recharge. We understand the concept that every night or every so often, these things have to be recharged. But somehow we, we take for granted that we don't have to spiritually be recharged ourselves. But my friend, just like that battery in your phone needs to be recharged, that spiritual man, that spiritual woman inside of each one of us, it has to be recharged. It needs to be energized by the fellowship, by the preaching, by the singing. And so coming to the midweek service, will do that for you. Now let's look at our text tonight. The Gospel of Mark chapter 5 in verse 19. A very different verse. Mark chapter 5 verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not 
but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. Now notice this, and all men did marvel. Now this is the end of the uh, record. I hate to use the word story, but it's the end of the record of the event of what we commonly know as the maniac of Gadara. How many of you guys remember that, that Bible story? Uh, that there was a man, he was possessed by devils and demons and he was a mess. And Jesus wonderfully saved him. And he said, I, Jesus, I just want to be with you. Jesus, I want to follow you. I, I, there's, I, you've done so much for me. I just And Jesus said, no. As far as I can tell, he's the only man in the scriptures that, that wanted to follow Jesus, that Jesus said, no, that's not my will. That's not my plan for your life is for you to be with me. Jesus had a bigger plan for him and a better plan for him. Jesus said, look at me, he says, go home to thy friends. Now notice, this is our subject tonight, and tell them how great things, you can circle that, if you circle or highlight in your Bible, great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath compassion on thee. Now, tonight we're in a series on discipleship and evangelism, and the, th the, the subject tonight is witnessing with our testimony. Now, I'm here in this text tonight because after I'd finished the lesson and got it all done and typed up, as I'm uh, reading and studying the, this verse, I was like, oh, that's a perfect verse. All right, Brother Tim, I, I hate that. When I'm done with the lesson, I got it all. I've already printed it. I'm like, well, I can't change the thing. But So we're just going to call an audible and go here. And uh, I believe the Lord just brought this verse out to me to, tonight uh, in, in a part from the lesson. You say, see, I'm not, I'm not bound to the lesson. I want to I follow the, the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, and I believe God is a God of order and God of orderliness. And I, I do believe in teaching with the lesson. I think preachers can get off track and just kind of meander through uh, a, a lot of fields if they don't have a plan and a purpose. Uh, I respect your time. You give me this time. I want to I uh, do much with it. Uh, but I never want to be so tied to a lesson or a plan uh, that I never follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in the pages of your Bible you'll find a more powerful illustration of using your personal testament. Now, uh, listen, this man just got saved. This man just got the demons cast out of him this man just got some clothes on this man just now got in his right mind he wasn't going to bible college he had no formal training he didn't even have a bible he barely had a set of clothes on and jesus said go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee now notice what he did we're going to read verse 20 we're going to pray we're going to get into the message tonight and he departed and began to publish in decapolis now, if you were to study that, now, uh, we, we kind of get the, lose the meaning of the significance of that. The Decapolis uh, was a city, uh, uh, if you know metrics at all, deca means 10, all right? And uh, that was a, there was a group of 10 cities that collectively were called Decapolis. It was a group of 10 localized regional cities, and that was called collectively Decapolis. He began to publish in Decapolis through these 10 cities how great things Jesus had done for him. Now notice, and all men did marvel. My friend, I want to I want to talk to you tonight. I want to present to you tonight the power of a personal testimony. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful time together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come. Lord, to be discipled in your house and in the things of God. God, I pray tonight, Lord, the hope, my prayer for this message is twofold. One, Lord, if there's Christians here tonight, Lord, who have never shared their faith in Jesus Christ with anyone, Lord, I pray that you would bring them to confidence in you. I pray, Lord, you'd give them some truth and help to help them, Lord, with some tools to help them to share their faith. Lord, I pray for those of us in here tonight that have begun and those of us who are involved in sharing. Lord, I pray that we would be challenged to become more better and bolder in sharing our faith. So, Lord, we pray that you would accomplish your purpose tonight. And, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. And amen. Now, tonight, I want to just jump right into it. Uh, look at the top part of your notes tonight. Uh, I want to be mindful of the time. Uh, we are called to testify. In your notes, it says we are called to testify. Jesus has called us to be his witnesses. Notice there, I wrote down in your notes, uh, Luke 24, 48. Look at what Jesus said, and ye are, what was that word there? Witnesses of these things. Is Luke 24, 48 in your notes? Say yes or no. Shake your heads. All right, then that was pathetic. Let's read it again. Luke 24, 48, and ye are what? 
witnesses of these things. Jesus has called us to be his witnesses. Now, I want you to think of a court of law. How many of you have ever heard about, seen a court of law? Raise your hand. I've seen, heard about a court of law I've been a, 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 where there's a judge and there's a jury and there's people and there's lawyers and there's a, there's a courthouse and they're going to give testimony. They're trying a case. Now, a witness. You say, where are you going with this preacher? Look at your notes. A witness is one who is called to make a statement to establish this, the facts. To establish the facts of what they have, two things. Number one, they have seen or experienced. So I want to help you tonight. I know a lot of folks are very afraid of witnessing. My friends, when the... <clears throat> When the, uh, whether it be the court system or the judge or the lawyer calls you to be a witness, he doesn't say, now, are you comfortable with this? No, all right? If you've ever been subpoenaed and said, no, you're going to come give a witness, all right? They're going to say, now, are you nervous about this? I don't care. <laughs> uh, they're going to, are you a gifted witness? Are you, are you gifted at sitting on the stand and taking the oath? Are you gifted at telling the truth? No, they just said, look, if you've seen it, if you've experienced it, if it's relevant, then I'm going to call you. You're going to be called, and you're going to be a witness. You're going to take the stand and put your, I don't know if they still do this or not, put your hand on the Bible and say, I uh, promise to tell what? The truth, what? The whole truth, what? So help me God. A witness is one who's called to make a statement to establish the facts of what they have seen or experienced. They provide proof for those who have not seen or not experienced to certify the truth of the matter. That's what a witness is. My friends, please d take away from the fact that you've never been to Bible college. Take a fa away from the fact that maybe you're nervous about it or you're inexperienced about it or you know nothing about it. Look, if you've been saved, Jesus said in uh, uh, Luke 24, 48, he says, ye, ye are witnesses of these things. Write down this verse, Acts 1.8. We've all heard of this verse, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I want you to listen very intently with your ears. Jesus says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus has called to be a what? A witness. Look, you just got to take the stand in life and say, look, this is what I've seen. And this is what's happened to me. That's using your testimony. I want you to stop making the excuse that you're nervous, you're inexperienced, you're untrained. Uh, you don't have this. You're not comfortable with it. You're not, uh, you're not experienced. God has said you, Jesus said, you're my witness. Jesus isn't here. Jesus doesn't write it in the sky. Jesus says, I need someone to simply stand up and say, this is what I've seen and this is what I've experienced. My friend, that's what we're called to do. I'm not called, look, I don't convert anybody. That's God's job. Uh, it's not my job to, I, I stopped a long time ago trying to argue with people. I, try, I don't argue people into the kingdom of God. I testify. A witness gives a testimony. That's what we're talking about, your testimony. All right, now, let's look at the next thing. We are commanded to speak. We are commanded to speak. Next thing in your notes. God in all ages has called his people to be a verbal witness for him. In all ages, God has called each one of us to be a verbal witness for him. Our life must match our lips, but God intends for the world to hear his message from his people. I believe I put in your notes there, Psalm 107, verse 2. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now, let me just ask you tonight, by the signification of an upraised hand, if you're saved tonight, raise your hand. Oh, okay, all across the room, wonderful, you're saved. That means you've been redeemed from the hand of the enemy. So in one on Psalm 107, verse 2, you say, Pastor, how do I apply that verse to my life? The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Just say so. Say, hey, I'm saved. Hey, I'm on my way to heaven. My friends, uh, 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 jot down in your notes there, Isaiah 62, verse 6. Jot down Isaiah 62, 6. I can't fit all these in your notes, or I'd have to make it size 12. And for those of us over the age of 45, we can't see size font 12 anymore, all right? Brother Tim, Pastor Tim just got a brand new Bible, and it's in size font 8. I'm like, that's wonderful, brother. You enjoy it. I'll never use it, because I'd have to have it up here with my readers on. In Isaiah 62, in verse 6, it says, I have set a watchman... Upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, 
Now listen, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. He says, ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. I love that verse. You know what that says? Listen, if you're saved, if you're redeemed, if you're on your way to heaven, you ought never to shut up. You know, that's the thing. They couldn't shut up the Apostle Paul. They tried. They tried to beat him. They tried to put him, uh, shipwreck him. Uh, they tried to put him in prison. They tried to do everything, and he wouldn't shut up. You know why he got a hold of that? He said, uh, ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not... Why is it that Jesus is the only one we can't talk about? People are not shy about sports. They're not... You get a guy that loves NASCAR, and that's all he talks about, NASCAR. You get a guy that talk, loves uh, basketball. That's all they'll talk about, basketball, stock market. And th- th- everybody will talk about everything, but why is everybody so ashamed of Jesus? He says, ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent. Listen, there's not enough people talking about Jesus. Next section in your notes, our salvation testimony. I'm mindful of your time. You might get the impression that this is a subject that I'm passionate about. Now, when I'm passionate about something, I tend to get a little excited about it, and I also tend to go long. So I'm trying to keep myself on track for sake of time tonight. We're going to have the men's ensemble uh, pr- uh, sing tonight uh, or practice tonight. I'm getting ready. This is, uh, we're getting ready to go back to school, so I want to make sure that I'm on time with that. Now, one of the greatest tools, tools for evangelism and sharing the gospel is our personal salvation testimony. One of the greatest tools for sharing the gospel is our personal salvation testimony. Now, write this verse down here, Philemon 1.6. Philemon 1.6. The Apostle Paul was writing to Philemon, uh, the uh, Christian man who got saved, and he says this that the communication of thy faith that what we would call witnessing may become effectual all right it'll mean something listen by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus you know what the apostle Paul was telling Philemon he says look if you want your witness to be effective you need to make much of Jesus You need to acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. He said, listen, you, Philemon, need to open your mouth and start telling everybody, just like what Jesus told to the man in Mark chapter 5, go home and tell them how many great things the Lord hath done for thee. Now, here are the benefits of witnessing with your testimony. Here are the benefits of witnessing with your testimony. Number one, every Christian has one. Every Christian has a testimony. All right, number two, we're going to move quickly through this. Number one, because I want to get to some of the uh, meat of the lesson tonight. Every Christian has it. If you are saved, you have a testimony. Number two, it is always with you. All right, I have discovered, Brother Merle keeps preparing me for my 50s. Thank you, Brother Merle. I appreciate that. He's five years ahead of me. He keeps, he, he keeps wonder, blessing me with these wonderful uh, nuggets of truth of what lies ahead. Now, now, there's many times that I, I've discovered I don't have everything that I need, all right, or have everything with me. Now, my testimony is always with me. Number three, number three, it cannot be taken from you. Listen, I don't know what's going to happen in the election. I, I don't know what's going to happen in our country. But I know this, that there are Christians right now in North Korea that they don't have a gospel tract. They don't have a shred of a Bible. They have nothing, but they have their testimony. It cannot be taken away from you. They can, take, they can wrest the Bible from my, my, my hands. They can, physically. Uh, they can take every last one of the gospel tracts uh, that I have. Uh, they can take everything. But listen, they can't take my testimony. They can't. I have it. Uh, number four. Number four, it is relatable to everyone. The testimony is relatable to everyone. Listen, from beggar to boardroom. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It didn't just say the poor people or the rich people. It says your testimony is relatable to everyone. Now, I want to get into this because how many of you have had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home and getting saved in early age? Raise your hand. You've uh, you've you've had that opportunity. All right. Now, I have, I never forget one time my wife and I, we were, uh, uh, when we were teen leaders, we had a young girl come up to us and say, I don't have a testimony. And I'm like, well, we're going to take our Bible. We're going to fix that right now. And she said, no, 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 I'm saved. But she's like, nobody wants to hear my, I don't have a testimony. Now, this is what she was saying. She was saying, I was born into a Christian home, and I was homeschooled, and 
I've never drank and I've never smoked and, and I've never messed around and, and I've gone to church every Sunday, Wednesday and Sunday morning, Sunday night and every revival my whole life and I got saved when I was five. That's my testimony. She said, I don't have a testimony. I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Look at the next section of your notes because I want to help you. All right, because a lot of people are like, well, I, you know, I didn't get saved out of the gutter and I didn't get saved out of life of crime. You think, I don't have a testimony. Yes, you do. Listen, there are two types of salvation testimonies. Number one, the Paul testimony. This is very important to understand. There are two types of people. Number one, those with the Paul testimony. A life saved out of sin. A life saved out of sin. You can look that reference up in uh, 1 Timothy 1.13. Paul says, look, I was a blasphemer. I was injurious. And Paul got wonderfully saved, listen, out of a life of sin. But that's not the only kind of salvation testimony in the Bible. Number two, or you might have the Timothy testimony. The Timothy testimony, listen, a life saved from sin. So you might have been saved out of sin. Wonderful. But you might have been saved from sin. More wonderful. Listen, uh, uh, every person. Now, I, I had a wonderful privilege of being uh, raised in a Christian home. It was a divided home. It was a, it was a tumultuous home. I, I had that run, I, but I had a privilege of going to church. Now, I, I've met a lot of people that don't get the privilege of going to church. I did have the privilege of going to Christian school. Not everybody has the privilege of going to Christian school. I had the privilege of getting saved at a young age. Listen, but as I talk to people, whether I'm talking to a beggar or a man from the boardroom, whether I'm talking to uh, someone who's full of drugs and uh, homeless, as I was talking to a man just uh, the other day who was, man was homeless, and uh, literally he lived in a, in a uh, shed in, in one of the trailer parks over here. And we got to talk brother to brother. He was saved, I was saved. Listen, listen, number one, let, this is not in your notes, number one, my condition was the same. Whether you're a Paul testimony or a Timothy testimony, whether you were saved out of sin and whether you were saved from sin, listen, my condition was the same. We were both on our way to hell. Number two, the conviction was the same. Every single person that gets saved gets saved because of the conviction. I can, I'll never forget as a young boy, I was under such deep conviction of sin. My destination was the same. Hell, number two, the conviction was the same. Uh, number three, the Christ was the same. The same God that saved the, the, the drug addict out of the gutters of sin was the same God who saved me from the gutters of going into sin. Listen, my friend, just because you don't have... Does anybody know Jim Delishmitt in here? Does anybody happen to... My wife and several of us might know Jim. Jim Delishmitt was the president of the Hells Angels of St. Louis, Missouri. Jim Delishmitt did a lot of wicked things. Jim Delishmitt should have gone to jail. Jim Delishmitt probably should have been put to death, but legally, for all the things he did. But God saved the president of the Hell's Angels of St. Louis, Missouri, out of a wicked life of sin. My friend, listen to me. My young Rob Hoeful, who grew up in a Christian home, had the same destination, which was hell, and the same conviction, which was of sin, and the same Christ who saved us both. So my friend, never let anybody tell you you don't have a testimony. You may have a specific type of testimony. Now listen, let me just make a note here. When giving, if you were saved, if you have a Timothy testimony, this is, unless I'm talking, like when I was talking over here uh, last year to, to Brother Freddie, Brother Freddie had come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we were talking about the matter of water baptism and making that public. But listen, unless I'm talking to a young person, I rarely tell someone that I got saved when I was six. If I'm talking to a teenager, if I'm talking to an adult, if I'm talking to, listen, uh, uh, I relate. The experience is the same. It doesn't matter what age you experienced it. No matter whether you're 6, 16, or 66, when you're uh, lost and on your way to hell, the condition is the same. Uh, when you're under the conviction of the, your need of Christ, the conviction is the same. The salvation experience and that faith in Jesus Christ, whether you're 6 or 66, it's the same. The same Holy Spirit that saved the 6-year-old saved the 66-year-old. Do you understand? It's relatable. My personal testimony can relate to anyone, anywhere. And so it's a wonderful tool. Now, Paul's personal testimony. Let's look at our next section note. Paul's personal testimony. If you were to look in, in Acts chapter 9, we won't turn there, but a man by the name of Saul meets the Lord Jesus Christ and is wonderfully saved. Now, twice in the scriptures, it's recorded that, the, the, that Paul, who became known as Saul, gave his salvation testimony. 
In Acts chapter uh, 22, Paul gives his testimony to a large crowd of Jews. And then in Acts chapter 26, uh, Paul gives his testimony before King Agrippa and other folks. Now, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 22. Turn with me to Acts chapter 22. I want to take a look at this. In Acts chapter 22, I'm being mindful of the time here tonight. Acts chapter 22. Now, if you were to get and read Acts chapter 21, we don't have time. The Apostle Paul was in the temple. The people saw him in the temple. They drug him out of the temple. They were about to rip him literally in pieces. They were going to kill him. He was delivered. He was rescued by some Roman soldiers. They'd carry him up a flight of stairs. He'd stand at the top of stairs, clothes half ripped off, covered in stones and dust, bleeding probably. And, and we get here uh, to verse chapter 21 and verse 40. And when he had given him license, this is the centurion giving Paul the ability to speak, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with a hand unto the people and there made a great silence. And he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And when they had, uh, had heard that he spake in the Hebrew to them, uh, they kept the more silence. And he said, now, I want pause. I want you to get the scene in your mind. Here's Paul. He's at the top. He's just been pulled out of the, the temple. There's this whole throng of people still got stones in their hands. They're still ready to kill the apostle Paul. Uh, he has, he's looking out at this seething mass of people. He has the opportunity, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, to share with them what has compelled him. So what did the apostle Paul, did, did, did he open it up and did he, did he share the Romans' road? All right, uh, the book of Romans was not written yet. Okay. Eh. Did, did he pull out from his tunic the wordless book? I love the wordless book. Now the green, now the black page, and then the green page and the red page. No, nobody had invented the wordless book. All right. He was wearing sandals, so he couldn't pull on a sock puppet and give them a little, uh, a little sock puppet talk. All right. He couldn't do that. The Apostle Paul didn't have a, a, a scroll with him. The Apostle Paul was not prepared to, uh, to preach a mess. So what did the Apostle Paul do in this critical juncture of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Notice what he did. He said, look at verse 3. He said, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect man of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. Now, number one, I just want to point that just in passing. Now, this is what Paul is doing. Look down in your notes here. Paul was giving, first of all, his life before Jesus. You see that in Acts 22, 3 through 5. At number two, then when we get into verse 6, we're going to see how Paul met Jesus in verse 6 through 11. And then Paul's life with Jesus in verses 12 through 21. Now, write these next three things down on your notes below this. Number one, our testimony, your testimony, is our life before Jesus. That's the first part of your testimony, where you were, what your condition was, how you came under, how you heard. Number two, how I met Jesus. The where, the when, and the what of how you went from being lost to being saved. Now, you may not remember the date. You may not remember, I don't remember the date. No one wrote the date down for me. I don't know what day of the week I was saved on. I don't know what date on the calendar I was saved on. Quite frankly, uh, my mom's passed on to heaven. She's the only one to know the, the year that I was saved in. But listen, I may not know the day, the date, or the year, but I know I got saved. I know I met Jesus. Number three, the third part of our testimony is our life with Jesus. I want to make a very important point. The Apostle Paul, here, as he was giving them his life before Jesus, he paid them a compliment. These people that were about to rip him apart and stone him to death. It's a very important part. When you and I are witnessing and sharing our testimony, this man that I met just this week, just up the road here, you know what, I, I, had, I could have ripped him up and down one side and exposed every lie and, and falsehood about what he believed. But you know what, you see what the Apostle Paul did? He says, I and was zealous towards God as ye are all this day. Do you know there's a wonderful place with being respectful and being kind in presenting our testimony. Now, look at verse 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering them into prison, both men and women. He's giving his life before Jesus. I want to jump now down to verse 6. And it came to pass, as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. They that were with me saw indeed the light when were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there shall be told thee all things which are appointed for thee to do. And you'll see here, this was how Paul met Jesus. And then he continues on with that story, the narrative of the events. And then verses 12 through verse 21, he talks about his life with Jesus. Now, this is where we're going to get into. I just have five, I'm going to take five more minutes. We're going to finish this. Let's look at the last part of these notes here. I'll let you read the rest of the chapter. I'll let you read Acts chapter 9. I'll let you read Acts chapter 22. I'll let you read Acts chapter 26 and compare the event to how Paul shared his testimony in different settings. Now, there are three things that your testimony needs to be. Look at down the next section, all right? The first thing, now consider your personal salvation test experience and begin to think about how to express our salvation experience to others in a, number one, organized, in an organized way, all right? This is why I've given you this worksheet. Everybody, if you have this worksheet, now you can grab a lot more. If you need more, that's fine. But if you have never written down and never thought about your testimony, I want you to think about, uh, number one, an organized fashion. My life before Jesus, how I met Jesus, and my life with Jesus. A good salvation testimony should be able to be presented within two minutes, all right? Organized. Number two, concise. Concise. If I'm going to be effective, like Paul talked to Philemon, I need to have my, tel- my salvation testimony organized in my thought and on paper. Number two, concise. Uh, you, you weed out all it. Now, listen, there are times if I'm on a, if I'm on a plane flight, I've done this a lot of times, and uh, listen, when I get on a plane and I'm flying by myself, I'll bring, a, I'll bring the biggest Bible I have and just pop it wide out. If you want to be not disturbed, you don't have to turn the light off. You, don't have to, you just bring out your 1611 King James Bible, put that on your tray, and it's like, poof, everybody leaves you alone, all right? except the people who are really interested, all right? Now listen, concise. And I've sat on the plane next to people and I've spent the, from here to China talking to them about my salvation experience. But I've also stood at a door and told people in less than two minutes how I got saved. Our salvation experience needs to be concise. Number three, it needs to be meaningful. Meaningful, what does that mean? Just like I expressed before, listen, the experience is the same. That, that you, you were lost and on your way to hell. Whether that you were 5, 15, or 55, you were lost and on your way. It needs to be relatable. It needs to be meaningful. That conviction that they felt, you felt, they felt. That need of salvation that you felt, they, they're experiencing or they need. It needs to be meaningful. And then as you express your testimony, not only organized and concise, meaningful, what has happened in your life since you met Jesus? You see, that's what Jesus told the man in Mark chapter 5. He says, go tell everybody how many wonderful things have happened to you, what happened to you, and what God has done for you. And he did. And everybody marveled. Now, developing your personal salvation testimony. These are the steps you say, Pastor, I want to do this. How do I do this? Number one, write down your salvation testimony. If you need to grab 75 of these, you tell me. We'll print more. If you need them on 8.5 by 11, we'll do that. Uh, number one, write down your salvation testimony. If you've never written it down, listen, you need to write your salvation testimony down for yourself. Number two, you need to write your salvation testimony down for your family. You need to leave it behind so your kids and your grandkids know, hey, that my mom, my dad, they, this is when they got saved. This is how they got saved. It will speak to them. Write it down. Number two, organize your testimony in its three primary sections. Before Jesus, meeting Jesus, and with Jesus. Break it down. Talk about it. Figure, think about it. Meditate on it. Number three, number three, if you were saved out of a life of sin, listen, be honest but not graphic about your past. G- Paul, as he was talking to Philemon, he said this, your, the, 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 the communication of your faith become effectual when you acknowledge every good thing that's in you because of Christ Jesus. Not because you talk of all the wicked stuff that you used to do, Listen, your salvation testimony becomes effective when we're honest about our past, but we're not graphic. Let, let's not give the devil glory in our testimony. Let's let the glory go to God. I've heard a lot of salvation testimonies that gave a lot of glory to sin and wickedness. Uh, let's give the glory to God. Now, number three, or number four, number four, make much of Jesus. Make much of Jesus. 
Number five, look for opportunities to share. Look, don't wait. Look for opportunities to share your testimony. Work on your testimony, get it ready. And then pray, pray, pray that God will give you an opportunity to share your testimony. I heard a story, actually I read a story <clears throat> of a lady. I, I wanna just encourage you in this fashion. A lady in New York City, she was elderly and she was completely bedridden. As I understand, this was a number of years ago before everybody had air conditioning, but she was up about on the 13th or 14th floor of her building. She was confined to her bed, confined to her room. And yet she had a burning desire to share her faith with people. It was pre-internet, pre-cell phone, pre-all of this. And she asked her preacher to bring her gospel tracts every week. And the pastor, week after week, would come back and, and, and she'd, they'd be gone. And, and he said, how are you giving these tracts out? He said, the same aides and the same people are here week after week. He said, are you gay? He said, no, I'm not giving them to them. them. Lady says, every day, she says, I'll take a small handful at different times a day and I'll, I can reach up and I can open my window and I can take these gospel tracts and all I can do is throw them out the window and I just give them to God. One day, a New York City police officer, it's a true story, the police officer was giving the testimony. He was sitting in his cruiser. He'd seen the worst kind of violence and scum of humanity in his career and he thought about just ending his whole life he gave the testimony he says i sat there in my cruiser saying god if you are real would you just please show me and he sat in his cruiser right about that time there came a little piece of paper fluttering out of the air and landed face down on his windshield he said he reached around he pulled it off his windshield and sat there and got saved. Let me tell you something. If you and I have a desire, that police officer went later and went through that building and he, through observation, saw about where the gospel tracts were coming from. He found that lady and he says, because your desire to share your faith in Jesus, I'm saved you and I have a desire my friend there's no excuse if you want to you and I want to share our faith pray that God will use you I'll close with this Abraham Lincoln said this prepare yourself and be ready and perhaps your chance will come let's pray heavenly father we thank you lord god we thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation father we thank you lord god i cannot even imagine lord only lord only you would be comfortable with with